What is up, generals? We are back with Ultimate General Civil War, and we are uh, at the start of a new series. This is an exciting time, right? Um, so just as a heads up, we are using the latest revision of the game, 1.11, blah, 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 all that stuff. And we're using JNP's version 1.25 rebalance mod. Now, at the moment, I have all the sound turned off because we are going to do this uh, sort of your career screen. And uh, in the background of this, there's all this people reading off, I presume, um, actual sp uh, speeches from the era and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, if this is your first time discovering the channel, uh, welcome. Um so uh, I'm Fiasco, and uh, we play on this channel, mostly it seems, Ultimate General Games. So uh, in this series is going to be playing the Confederate side at the legendary difficulty level. You should know that if you're playing the game at a lower difficulty level, most of the strategies I'm using here are going to work, but the enemy is going to be less aggressive. I think, than he will be when I am playing on Legendary Difficulty. So the first thing we discover, so you're a kid, whatever, you wanted to go join the army. Um, what did we graduate out of West Point? So the Tactician, Strategist, and Logistician um, perks all offer AO1, Army Organization. So if you're new to the game, that means the size of your army or how many units you can have within your individual command. Uh, and then you have the choice of recon training or logistics. Where do you focus your early career? So recon uh, does a couple of things. It uh, gives you some more information about the enemy army before the battle begins. Uh, it gives you some information about the enemy army during the course of the battle. And in the rebalance mod, it increases the, 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 vis the spotting statistic, which is a characteristic your units has that, that sort of tells you how far they can see. It increases that at a rate of, I believe, um, 50 points of spotting per tick. Now, I'll confirm that value later on, but I think that's the right number. Training does two things. One, it makes the recruiting of, rec uh, of, of uh, expert soldiers from somewhere else, veterans somewhere else in the army, cheaper, and it buffs the stats of your raw recruits by, I believe, two points per tick. And what that means is two things. One, it's cheaper to recruit existing veterans and the uh, raw trainees just coming out of basic training will have gotten better training in their basic training. So your basic raw free recruits are going to be cheaper. Now, we'll get to all that stuff at the end of the training battle and I'll talk about how recruits work and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're watching a legendary series, there's a pretty good chance you've played the game before. And if not... Again, welcome. This is a very exciting game. Um, logistician uh, provides the AO point, right? And then the logistics perk. The logistics uh, increases the amount of ammunition that each unit carries as a baseline. And it also increases the number of weapons that are available in the store. When you get past the battle, you're going to be at a screen called the camp screen. And there you can arm and equip your soldiers. Um, without the logistics perk, you're going to, uh, your, your army is going to have poor access to the most modern weapons. And with good logistics, you're going to have better access to uh, lots of weapons. So we're going to go ahead and pick the training strategy. The reason we're going to do that is uh, we're also going to pick infantry for the same reason. Um, and uh, I'll talk about it as we go on. Um <clears throat> So uh, we talked about logistics already. Medicine gives you an effect that I call trickle back. When you take casualties in the field, um, medicine at the end of the battle returns a certain percentage of those casualties back to your army. Now, this is an excellent, very efficient choice. It basically means that um, every soldier that doesn't die is is a both a veteran you don't need to replace and is basically a free veteran, essentially. It's a free veteran and a free gun. So every point in medicine is an incredibly efficient pick to make, but it's one that I prioritize for in the middle game. Uh, we already talked about training. We already talked about recon. We've already talked about these stats. So I'm going to go ahead and pick training again, infantry again. And the rationale is that training helps you build your army up in the early game. Ergo, in my mind, it is the most valuable when you're building your core army 
Um, for those of you who played before, before the Battle of Shiloh, you are growing your army at an exponential rate. And after Shiloh, you kind of don't grow your army at the same speed. After Shiloh, you can afford to slow down a bit and 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 rely on raw um, experience to build your army up for you. And and then I think at that point, training starts to lose a lot of its value because at that point in time, you're not growing your army as explosively. Um, so for our last point here, it would be silly, I think, to double down hard on training and set my army back so far in every other field. So we're going to go ahead and pick business and pump our economy and our logistics. We've not talked about economy before now because we haven't had access to the stat. So what economy does is it makes every gun you buy cheaper. It's a very powerful stat that is really kind of only useful on the macro strategic uh, campaign. So if you're playing, you have the choice at the end of this screen to pick Confederate or Union. Uh, Union generally has weaker individual soldiers, but better access to resources. And the Confederacy generally has excellent individual soldiers, but limited access to artillery um, and modern rifles. So we're going to go ahead and click Legendary Mode. And we're going to go ahead and click on the Major General Difficulty. Now, uh, to the viewers, I'm going to keep reloading this until I get the starting perks I want. That is the unfortunate reality of um, random perks on the initial battle. But I'm not going to make you guys watch me do that again and again and again. So let's see what we get. Okay. Okay, so I had to do that a couple of times. Um, but we have um, our first chance to take a look at the mission. So if you've played the game before, this is nothing new for you. But if you're new, um, welcome to the heart and soul of Ultimate General. This is the battle map. This is the tutorial screen that you will be... Um, approached with let's just click that yep let's overwrite the panda mod save okay so um our objective as this uh division of new soldiers is to capture this fort and it, it will, you know, I don't know. There's some historical context as to why we're doing this. Um, we're given Siegfried and Kemper. These are units that we control. And we'll walk over the UI here in a little bit. So every soldier, every brigade, this is a, supposed to be a brigade of soldiers, is uh, the game kind of abstracts a brigade. So there's several regiments or several battalions uh, under the command of a, a, a brigadier, uh, a person operating in the role of brigadier. Now, in the case of Siegfried, he's only a colonel. Um, but he has 1,415 soldiers. Uh, morale is how willing they are to keep fighting. Cover references what kind of defensive position or posture they're currently in. And this gives you an idea of what type of cover it is. So right now we're in thick foliage or thick trees. And then the condition is the stamina of the soldiers, how tired they are, how physically exhausted. Up here, you're going to see a little eye icon. You click here and you can see what they're armed with. In the case with Siegfried, he's armed with the MJNG single shot rifle. You can see their position in the Army's um, table of organization, 1st Corps, 1st Division. And you can see their perk. Now, you'll notice that Hexamer has a little star, sorry, uh, Siegfried has a little star right here, and Hexamer does not, nor does Crocker. These perks have, these units have no perks. Certain units, as they level up or get more experience, will gain perks. Eventually, so too will my general, although he doesn't have them now. So, uh, like that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at the, um, the mission. So, I've played this battle enough times before to know that there are reinforcements coming from this direction, and I want to intercept them before they get to the fort. Otherwise, this is going to be a very short endeavor. So, with that being the case, I'm also going to try and use Hexamer here as bait to keep 
uh, the defenders on this side of the river busy. All uh, right, so you're going to go there. You're going to go there. Nope, that's the general. You don't care about really where you go. Um, we'll figure that out. And then you're going to go there. All right. Um, so when you see this sort of cone coming out from the unit, if you don't have the game modded, first of all, these units are going to be at different sizes. These perks are going to say different things. They're going to have different weapons. All that's going to be changed. Additionally, if the game isn't modded, this is going to be black and very hard for you to see, and the cavalry won't actually even have one. Um, so keep all of that in mind. And oh, we're going to go ahead and turn the sound back on. Um, so if you're playing this or you've played this on your own, you'll you'll know there's this speech going on in the background, and and it makes it very hard to concentrate while I'm talking. Uh, all right, so Crocker's being shot. That's awesome to know. Uh, fortunately, the early game skirmishers do not appear to be very well equipped or very well trained. Um, we need to get Crocker out of the line of fire ASAP. So this is a particularly precarious position because we're attempting to cross this river and we're under fire in the process. And you see just how aggressive these skirmishers are. They're chasing after cavalry, um, exposing their flank, exposing themselves to, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of damage. The thing is, is that the vanguard of my force is Hexamer, a unit composed of completely untrained, as far as I can tell, rookies with decent equipment, but no skill. Um, as you can see, we're at point blank range. There's 700 men firing muskets. We managed to kill seven men in the course of that volley. And I need to get across this river to intercept the reinforcements. Uh, coming towards the fort. So there's something to the effect of 1,600 men, give or take, marching to the fort. Yep, there they are. They just appeared literally out of nowhere. That's always good. So here we have 2nd uh, and 3rd Ohio, uh, and we now have, as well, Chetlin and unnamed skirmisher unit to deal with, which is always fun. So normally, these two units are over here in the woods, and I can just go ahead and fob off fighting them on Hexamer. So now I get to deal with the fact that these cats are over here chasing after my cavalry. Welcome to Legendary, where things are significantly more aggressive. Hexamer is still filling his role as Bullet Sponge, so that's, uh, that's okay. My command hasn't taken any casualties, which is always a good time. Well, with the exception of Crocker. I need the enemy to see me and come charging at me. Um... And I don't want them to just march on their merry way up this road here towards the fort. That's the last thing I want them to do. Okay. So we're going to speed it up a little bit. And this should look a little more familiar. Again, if you're relatively new, if you're playing the unmodded game, this should look about the right speed to how the game usually moves to you. Um, go check out the rest of my videos or my, my rest of my series. We have an earlier version of the mod I played, uh, and we also have a complete series uh, for the Union of... Uh, a major general playthrough at the major general major general difficulty level. Um, and my objective is to get as far as practical um, in 
this uh, legendary Confederate playthrough um, until one of two things happens. Uh, one, we break the game, and we're so much more powerful than anybody else that it's not fun for anybody to watch it, let alone like for me to play it. Uh, or we get to the end of the series, or they release a new version of the mod, um, whichever of the three occurs first. So I'm now running Kemper and Siegfried into position because they've wasted so much time fighting with these skirmishers that they're s they've been slowed down. And they want to be fighting right here. And the reason you want to do that is take a look at there's one tree there, there's two trees here, and there's no trees here. The game is telling you where the good place to fight is. This is nice thick cover, and now the enemy is engaging me out in the open or theoretically even in the river. The game will also give you some information. Notice that here we have 150% cover. Here we have 160% cover. Here they have 1% cover. God, they're really coming in, aren't they? This is legendary. This may be a mistake, theoretically. If we can't even catch them, who knows what will happen. Let's see if we can't cancel the charge. Got one. However, they appear to be in pretty good cover too. That's always a good time. This is worrisome. Um, okay, all right, so things have largely stabilized. We have managed to intercept um, the AI. So now it's all about getting into a good position. All right, so next thing, uh, we wanna back up a little bit with him. Look at the big circle, green circle, around legendary Fiasco. Now this will get bigger and bigger as Fiasco levels up. Within this circle, Fiasco gives a morale regeneration bonus to his units. He doesn't give them a buff to the actual raw, a raw amount of morale, but it allows them to regenerate that morale quicker in the event that they eventually lose morale from fire or something else. It'll keep your troops in the fight longer. It won't prevent them from routing if they take um, the kind of damage that would rout a unit. All right, we're trading very effectively here. but not without loss. All right. Of course, of course. So we play our cards right here. Second Ohio is gonna have no choice but to route soon. So a unit takes uh, morale damage based on the amount of incoming fire that it's suffering. Basically, that it, it, the game attaches a certain amount of amount of morale damage to every casualty received, and it it it, it, it attaches a, a higher modifier to casualties received from fire uh, from the flank or from the rear. Um, and so every now and again, you'll see, especially with Crocker, I've gotten some warnings about being flanked or rear flanked. Um, and that's that's exactly what leads to that uh, sort of situation. 
is is when I get that warning message, the game is telling me like, you're taking a lot of morale damage. You know, it's it's not a good time, uh, and your guys aren't gonna stick in the fight much longer. So second Ohio is gonna have no choice but to start running away soon. However, um, Hexamer, this is this is Hexamer up here. They're not very good at shooting guns, so this bar fills with a value between 0 and 100, higher numbers obviously being better. So as you may imagine, a firearms of 9, firearms being the stat that governs them shooting muskets, as you may imagine, a firearms of 9 is not exactly a very good or high number. Uh, so, you know, yeah, Hexamer has some lane learning to do. By comparison, uh, Kemper with a firearms of 29 or Siegfried firearms of 30, they're significantly better at shooting muskets than Hexamer, and they're still not all that good. But this is the early game. You know, neither side was really ready for this war. Neither side historically was ready to field the kinds of armies, the size of armies that were required to fight this kind of a war out. All right. So we've now gotten reinforcements. The Yankees seem determined to defend the fort. We've got reinforcements and supplies. Use them wisely. I will. So uh, we know that there's skirmishers over here. What do we get as far as Bernie is the marching speed perk, as is Canfield. But Allen, who of course has the... Oh, man. Allen, who has <laughs> the one... Non-rifled gun. This is a high end. This is a high end for the early game rifle. This is a high end for the early game rifle. This rifle has terrible melee stats, but they're the ones with the speed and the melee perk. By comparison, the unit with a decent melee weapon. I guess it's not any better, really. Um, what's the accuracy? Yeah, fine, whatever. Um. These guys, these are these are units that unfortunately I don't get to keep um, in in this battle. Uh, but we get reinforcements, loner troops, basically, uh, for the attack, for the initial attack on the fort. Uh, and they're larger than they should be because I used an exploit. Um, where if you reload as the battle be, if you if you save the game, reload the battle. Uh, the reinforcements here are larger than they should be. Um, and you know what? This this battle's hard enough as it is that I really kind of don't feel bad about it. Uh, nor should you. I, I, I genuinely feel that these battles are some of the hardest battles in the game. Um, these early tutorial fights. My goodness. I'm already being flanked by someone. As you can see, 2nd and 3rd Ohio have not decided to throw in the towel. They're just fine with the state of the state of the battlefield. Um, and my current mission, uh, which is to say killing these units before trying to take the fort, really hasn't changed. All I'm going to do is move Hexamer over here and try and outflank. Now, units gain stats over the course of the battle um, basically by doing anything. If they march, they gain stamina. Just by the, the virtue of being on the battlefield, they gain morale. Dude, stop hunting down my cavalry for fuck's sake. There are far, far, far more important targets for you to be shooting at. So units will get these stats by doing anything. Efficiency, they get it by getting kills. Firearms and melee, they get it by simply doing the thing. So every time they pull the trigger, even if they don't get a lot of kills, they get the firearm stat. Melee, same deal, although that one, you know, just by virtue of being in melee, you're going to get melee kills. Um, and efficiency uh, and command are stats that are li like, like linked together. 
So efficiency can never go higher than command. So this encourages you not to just put like random low level officers in units that are large. Um, otherwise, you'll see sort of this little red bar here. It means this unit's too large for someone like Atlan to command. on. Alright, who's fast? You're fast. Go over here. Go run these skirmishers down. Tired of this crap, Chatlin. All right, whatever. Bye. Good go away. Sure. This is all fine. These guys have, like, blinders on. They don't care about anything else. Mostly accomplished our objectives in the early phase of the battle. Which is to say, the entire point of this fight was pinning Chetlin into the corner and killing him. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, so, Third Ohio is soon to be shattered, and if he's not, he's combat ineffective anyway. Um, Allen here is in great terrain to fight with uh, Second Ohio. Well, I guess Bernie just kind of chills out. second Ohio out of here, or third Ohio out of here. I think it's pretty bad odds. I think it's pretty bad odds we're going to make them make, connect them, because they're slow. We've got no training in terms of speed, so I guess not. As you can see, charging kind of really takes it out of these units. Um... This is the sort of the, the tactical situation you want to be thinking about as you go through. Um, when and how can I be in the best possible tactical position while preventing my opponent from really doing any anything that they want to be doing? I'm going to go ahead and put my command here. They're gone before too long. 
Hexamer, to his credit, is getting better at shooting. They almost look competent here. Watch this. Just shatter. Bernie's huge. I'm just going to have him charge in there if he can. Come on. Okay, whatever. Get there. I don't know if it's possible for you to walk in slower. Holy crap, man. Em evaporate. Cool. That's even better. That's even better. Okay. So we're setting ourselves up well for... Ah, there you go. And they're shattered as well then. We're setting ourselves up well for the approach on the fort. Um, and the reason I say that is... There. There. The reason I say that is that now they're not going to have any of the reinforcements. So Canfield's gone. Uh, Second Ohio has been captured and is now going to be doing recon for me. And Third Ohio just shattered. So they're down 1,800-some-odd uh, soldiers from the defending force. Now, this f fort is far from defense lists. There's still, uh, I believe, the First Ohio... Uh, manning these defenses. There's two different units of cannon in here. And then uh, if I got one, that means there's at least one and possibly two other units of skirmishers that are uh, unaccounted for. Mm, excuse me. So we're going to have to wait until our attack force gets into position. We need to let them rest when they get there. As you can see, some of them have uh, quite a bit less condition than they used to have. We're going to need to let Hexamer uh, resupply and probably Siegfried too. And then I don't really care about Second Ohio. Um, except insofar as that's several hundred more muskets that we get to have. So I'm putting the game on very fast. Uh, and I mean, we've got plenty of time, plenty of time in, in three, three in game hours to accomplish our objective. So let's let these units rest up before we do anything else. He's good. They're all mostly fine. Now I know this is somewhat boring. But the best thing that we can do to even approach guaranteeing success is for us to um, measure our approach. Get them all rested. All right, condition's good. We're not going to touch the cavalry. They got way the hell too weakened. Go ahead. Give the order to advance. Now this is one of the more precarious moments in the mission. Because you want to... I guess you want to get in there at a certain like level... You don't want to approach 
uh, pell mell. You want to come in kind of all at once. Because uh, even though they are woefully outnumbered, uh, those cannons are going to be a real problem. So I want them to have too many targets all at once. And this is going to be a little paradoxical. I'm actually going to go ahead and bullet sponge with my with my general. Let's get everybody in position first. So we've started to receive artillery fire. It's ineffectual at this distance, but that will change. Varying levels of uh, speed to march with. That's always a good time. As you can see, we're taking light artillery fire at this distance. Again, that will change. All right. Let's let Alan get into position. I'm a little bit less worried about the kind of artillery fire I'm taking at this distance. It gets bad real quick. All right, so we're going to get these cats in there. Okay. Let's give the order. So why am I face tanking with my general? My general has 249 hit points and will often block line of effect uh, for opponent shooters, opposing shooters, explicitly artillery units. But they, as far as I can tell, they're flagged as skirmishers uh, and they take very limited fire on the way in themselves. So I'm face tanking with my general in order to kind of preserve my troops. More specifically, if I want someone to get shot at by a cannon, honestly, I want it to be him. I know that that seems terribly paradoxical, and I agree it is, but the general units have 249 hit points and take very limited direct fire. Okay. We're going to go ahead and charge Bernie and Canfield to their appropriate targets. We're going to get Hexamer in here. We got the General eating fire. He's already taken roughly half casualties. That's perfect. That's all I really need him to do is just eat the initial volleys. And now the base here has just too many targets to make effective targeting decisions. And so we come screaming into the base, evaporate first Ohio here. and start putting musket fire into these cannon units. In the vanilla game, melee is not very effective. Uh, it's, it's a high risk, high reward kind of thing. In uh, the rebalance mod, melee is generally a very effective uh, means of engaging your target, especially in the early campaign where defensive fires are not nearly as mature. Uh, it's very easy to overwhelm um, the defenses of a unit, especially with these larger units. It's very easy to come in and just absorb whatever body blow they can throw your way and make contact. So we're trying to white shield. So notice how Battery A's shield is glowing white. Notice how First Ohio's shield is glowing white. I use that term. I don't think it's an officially designed term. But we're trying to white shield Battery B here because they're the ones that are causing us the most guff right now.
Everything else is not really a problem. It's just battery B. And we just need them to stop shooting effectively. We just need to run to contact. Okay. So now that they've rounded, the battle's over. And now it's just a matter of, of seeing it through. And that was... Um, to be quite frank, that was one of the best uh, attempts at taking the fort I've ever played. I very frequently lose at least an officer uh, in there and and take massive casualties in the process. Uh, and this, by comparison, was the picnic. So, at least a little bit of that was uh, face tanking with my general. I think he, he lost about half of his hit points, but it was, I mean, they don't cost anything. They're not soldiers that, you know, I recruit. They just have 250 hit points. More, more guys routing, more guys like being resurrendered. Oh my, surrender logic is all kinds of funny. Congratulations, we've secured the fort and killed the artillery. Boo! Let's go to the next day. All right, so that's part A of the tutorial mission, and the tutorial mission would be interesting and difficult if that were it, but there is more. So we now have Bernie defending with us. Okay, so we've taken the month, the fort, and you notice uh, if you looked at the the, the, the day, I, I, I didn't, I forget what day it was starting on. It's been a few days, it's been like a week. So we've taken over these two batteries. They've joined us now. Um, so Cable, I think, is the unit we get to keep, and he's horse artillery. Fun. Uh, so... As you can see, Legendary Fiasco, our general, has reset his hit points. So we're going to go ahead and put him right here. There are two ironclads in the river. The Anacostia and the Thomas Freeborn. And they're going to shoot at us for the entire battle. That's very annoying. We're going to go ahead and pull the artillery out of those embankments or in gun points. And we're going to leave fiasco over here again face tanking the um naval artillery we're gonna go ahead and press fast forward uh, put both of the artillery guns on do not shoot and there is a version of the strategy for the defense of this position map position on the map where you actually leave the fortress and come fight over here um, I'm of two minds about that. Generally, I think it's okay, uh, but the issue is that you get over here and you're exhausted. And in the JNP rebalance mod, uh, being tired actually has a direct, uh, a direct trackable negative effect on the efficacy of your troops when fighting. So we have the 10-pound ordnance gun. A 10-pound ordnance gun, or the, uh, historically as ref was referred to as the three-inch ordnance gun is, as it says here, the most widely used rifle cannon in the war. It's a general uh, all-rounder. It's not going to excel at any one category, but it's useful in basically every category in which you would use a gun, with the possible exception of extremely close canister work. As you can see, it's only 33% accurate at uh, its closest possible range. So... Uh, let's take a look at what we're looking at here, um, especially if you're new to the Rebalance mod or if you're new to this game generally. Um, if you're new to this game generally, this will all look new to you. If you're new to the Rebalance mod, most of this screen will also look new to you. Um, so the damage range. Every time this gun fires, uh, these guns fire, it does a random die roll between 24.75 damage or 33 damage. Any any value in between those two numbers is the number it picks for how much damage is dealt. Then, a couple of uh, debuffs, as far as I can tell, are applied to that damage. So the damage range multiplier, depending on how far away it is. So let's say it rolls 30 to keep things nice and even. Each cannon at maximum theoretical range, let's say it rolled 30, 
each cannon would actually only do 15% of that damage dealt. Now, these numbers are modified by the unit stats, as you can imagine, and their perks. In the case of Cable, the unit we get to actually keep, um, he gets double the speed and a huge rotational uh, advantage. So this is actually a pretty good perk for a unit that needs to be up in the shit, so to speak. Now, it's less... It's not really the case uh, the, for a three-inch gun. Like, it's its best case, but that's, you know, we'll let it go. It's fine. Um, by comparison, the unit we don't get to keep, Merit, has the long-range focus, which gives the unit a 5% boost to its effective range and uh, an additional 25% shot and shell damage. So, um, what does shot and shell damage mean? So, it... 100% in short range, the cannon fires what's called canister. And essentially, I want you to think of a gigantic shotgun. That's basically what canister is. At medium and long range, the unit, uh, as you can see here, there's different bands on the on the rotational for merit as it comes around. So that inner band, inner band, that's the canister range. The middle slice of the band, that's the medium and long range. And the very like the very edge of the pizza slice, out here. This is uh, what I would call uh, the, the longest max range. So in from here to here, these, this portion is shot and shell, and then in here is canister. So this is shell out here where it's just literally a metal ball, and this is shot in here where it's kind of exploding shrapnel, and then like I said, in here it's canister, uh, or it's, it's, a, it's, it's a shotgun shell. So there's Crocker. We're going to just put him over here for recon purposes. They're beginning to approach. Um, they've brought along one larger brigade of artillery that's split. So one function of this mod, uh, if you're new to it, is that the AI has a chance to randomly double its units. And I've had this. It seems like this has happened a lot. So Brook, Burnham, and Lawman have all doubled. Uh, now, the doubled units will typically be smaller than their non-doubled counterparts. So, in the case of Brook, he's under 1,000 men. Um, Lauman is only 300 men, so it's only 15-some-odd guns versus, you know, a, a larger... I guess if there's another unit of artillery, they might be 400 and change, I don't know, per man. We're going to get some more infantry reinforcements down here, because otherwise things will look pretty precarious. So Fiasco's been being shot at by two Navy Ironclads this whole time, and he's down from 250 to 239. This is why I feel okay face tanking with him here and keeping the, the base defended with these guys in the walls. Now, when they're in the walls, they're going to be getting a 75% cover bonus, a projectile resistance, a melee resistance, and melee bonus of those numbers. I imagine that's the case over here as well. It is. So... These walls are really only good for cover, uh, but they're quite good in the role of cover. And we're going to go ahead and fast forward again while the AI figures out what it wants to do. So this defense, uh, if you're playing, especially for the first time, this defense gets pretty touch and go. Um, so we're getting into the heart of the video now, and unfortunately we're, we're you know, a ways into it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the artillery back on. And they're going to just start whittling away at things. There are many things I would do different if I was designing this battle from scratch. The first thing I would do is I wouldn't have this here. Second thing I would do is I would let you keep all the units you attacked the fort with in the first place. So we're going to use Crocker here because he's too small to be effective in combat. We're going to use him as kind of a destabilizing element. But we're going to try. And if they're just going to let us shoot the crap out of battle, I'm certainly inclined to let them do that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to see if we can't get the supply wagon. And then we're going to see if we can't kill kill General Nicholas here. Uh, I'm surprised that he's not moved more. Reload. 
So when you capture the enemy supplies like this, uh, at the end of the battle, if you manage to maintain control of the supply wagon the entire time, that's just free money. That's free money. So you're strongly incentivized to take the supply wagon and go turn it off. Click these two buttons here. Turn it off and make sure it's not handing out supplies. Um, that's interesting. I've never seen them approach from this particular angle before. Here we go. A charge. So when the enemy comes in like this for a charge, basically it's all hands on deck, especially in a situation like this where there's not really anywhere for me to ret retreat to. You get a unit immediately behind them. This game does not have well-defined line of sight rules, we'll say it that way. So units nearby can fire supporting fire directly into a swirling melee and there's no major rules for friendly fire. And... You need General Fiasco over here providing his melee buff. And he can do, he can face tank from there and provide the melee buff as well. The reason I say a charge is one of those all hands on deck kind of things. It's one of the place, one of the situations which can strongly destabilize a battle. If an enemy, if, if your line and the enemy's line is engaged in a firefight, you're gonna see and know that a unit is starting to, to flag long before it actually does so. And you'll be able to either position reserves or, you know, redevelop your line in a different manner or do any one of a dozen things that you can do to reposition and redevelop your line. When they charge, they're going to disrupt everything you're trying to accomplish. And they're going to do it in relatively short order. So we're over here, we're killing his general, but guess what? He's got 250 hit points too, so it's going to take a minute. Fortunately, generals don't have combat stats, as far as I can tell. So Crocker, despite being too small to be combat effective in any other role, has actually done a lot for us to take the weight off of our back for this battle. First thing he's going to do is about nine years from now, he's going to kill General Nicholas which means they're not going to be able to re, uh, rally themselves or provide their own melee buff or morale regeneration buff um, when things get charged in. The second thing that Crocker's done is Crocker has stolen the supply wagon, which means these units are going to be very hard-pressed to keep themselves supplied. And the enemy AI does in fact follow the same supply rules that we, the player, do. Uh, the enemy AI has to supply its troops with bullets, supply its, you know, cannons with shells. Now, it's it's highly 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 unlikely that these brigades here are going to um, run out of run out of, of rounds, but it's quite likely their artillery is going to run out of shell before too long. Now, additionally, because we've captured their supply wagon and are dragging it across their line of sight, as you can see, they're wheeling their cannon over here. I don't know why. They've just, they've sent detached an entire brigade to go fight them. But they're just really destabilizing their line um, to do this to, to, to try and you know get their supply wagon back. So Crocker has had an I would say a major outsized influence on the flow of this battle 
taking it from a desperate defense to one where we honestly feel I, I, like I feel pretty good. I feel okay. All entirely because a huge portion of their army is running down the supply wagon with honestly no chance of getting it. And we've got ours as well coming. Still going. He's okay. You'll get him. He's done. He's done his job. I'm very, very pleasantly surprised with their performance. So the AI now is going to be very hard pressed to launch a melee attack on our defenses. It doesn't mean they're not going to try, but they're not going to have a lot of success. Um, and the ludicrous size of Canfield and Allen's units also goes a long way towards kind of changing the way that this particular battle feels. Um, in my eyes, a lot. Because honestly, I feel kind of okay just countercharging this at this size. You know what I mean? So, um, all right. So we've now we've got kind of a dangerous situation because there's one, two, three units charging, possibly four. Yep, there's four. So now we need. This is gonna. Almost certainly one or more of these units is going to shatter. Uh, not shatter, uh, but, but, but break. Um, so we need to be careful here because this, this has a real good chance of going, of going poorly. So we need to try and find some of these charges and throw honestly any of them back anything that we can do to stall this attack including running Siegfried directly into combat As you can see, I'm not really worried about Canfield. Canfield can handle himself. This is still going fine because it can't go any other way. Bernie's fine. Bernie's okay. But this is worrying because Kemper will eventually break. Shermer has decided that this isn't going to work. they routed into me? That's interesting. Gosh, I wish I got to keep some of these units. Holy crap. Yep, so see, this is not wonderful. Uh, I don't really know what the fix is here because if I let them get out of those trenches, it's even worse. So now they're going to be okay, and the morale's going to come up, as you can see, pretty quickly. Uh, and then what I want to do now is I want to fall them back, and I want to swap in Siegfried, and then put Kemper in reserve. And then the transition from the one to the other does take time.
But it may be time, sooner rather than later, to leave this fort. I don't know. Again, the the AI kind of has the the, the the onus is on the AI to come to me. Yeah. Still, oh no, they got him. Good job. So there's no more general uh, to provide morale, and there's no more uh, re uh, supplies to, to, to keep them in the fight for longer, which means we've got a significant supply advantage long term. they're coming over to get their supply weapon back. Totally get it. I mean, I absolutely think that I would do the same thing in their shoes. So, when I click on you, yeah, maybe. to get Burnham to turn around. Woo, that was close. Okay. This is a very interesting time because their cannons are all sort of wheeling forward. And Burnham does not really know what it wants to do. Burnham wants my supplies. It wants its supplies back. Which all makes perfectly good sense. I get why Burnham wants those things. But, every second that these things keep kind of rocketing forward, it moves the uh, impetus more and more and more and more and more that to get to them, Burnham has to go through Canfield. And Canfield is just a larger object than Burnham. That's not possible. All right. So given the long-range focus of Merit, we're actually going to move Merit to counter battery work and leave Cable on counter infantry work. And we're going to get ready to charge Burnham here and remove the thorn in our side. Should be kind of a quick process. So, uh, we're in an interesting kind of stalemate. This is probably not super de duper exciting to watch, but the enemy army is too large for us to really go after it. But it's not large enough to take the fort. I think it's kind of interesting, damned if they do, damned if they don't. They don't really have a great play here, besides kind of just sticking it out. killed. So another nice effect in the vanilla game, that would have been it. Verna, Bernie killed and now the unit has no leader. 
in the rebel, uh, it generates a new light kernel to replace Colonel Bernie. And if this light kernel dies, it'll generate a new major to replace that guy. And if that major dies, it'll generate a captain to replace that guy. So in my lead up, run up, whatever, to this particular series, I played up through uh, first bull run on Legendary, basically asking myself, like, am I up to it? And um, that actually happened to my light infantry unit. Um, they, they being the AI, uh, were able to were able to like kill my colonel that was leading it, and then kill the light colonel leading it after he died, and then kill a kill the major. I mean, by the battle, by the time the battle was over, it was just some like random supply clerk <laughs> leading the unit. You know, like it was it was bad. Uh, it was very touch and go uh, that situation from a who exactly is leading this unit kind of perspective Yep, see, there you go. There's the ammo thing I was talking about. Colonel Tom Preston killed. Okay, that's good to know. That's actually really shitty uh, that Tom Preston's colonel is, is, is dead because he's, he's going to be hard to replace. Uh, and the game is almost certainly not going to give us an officer for free to do it with. Uh, so, yay! My colonel is dead. And as far as I know, Tom was just killed by like a random, you know, artillery shell. So he'll have to come from, he'll have to come from one of these units, his replacement, because he's killed, not wounded. That's great. Oh, thank Christ. That took forever and a damn day. So they've come in on, uh, like, it seems like kind of a last ditch attack. Like it's this or nothing, right? Like we can't, we can't go back empty hat in hand, I guess is maybe what's going on here. Uh, but again, like look at the, look at the forces on the table and look at what they had before. Look at the losses we've taken. So we've all, we've, we, we, we've suffered losses. People are like lower efficiency than they were at before but you know it's all like bearable it's all it's it's none of it's ideal i would love to have smaller loss numbers than i currently do but all of these are the kind of figures that i can recover from from an organizational standpoint perspective and uh, i guess that's what i mean by you know bearable losses the ai doesn't have enough troops to breach this fort anymore Especially if they won't actually attack the fort. It's another issue. It seems like they're not really willing to attack the fort.
but I can't come out yet. I can't come out yet uh, from the fort. I have enough men. I probably outnumber them, but um, I need Terry and Schumer, Shermer here to each route at least once, and then I can think about coming out. But at the moment, um, the AI are strong enough that a field battle would be disastrous for me. I'd still win it, probably, but at what cost? It's kind of my, it'd be a period victory, you know? And that's the concern. Get the last out of Crocker. Why not? Who's coming in? Grant wants some. Okay, should be fun. This should be enjoyable. I will charge at the last possible second. Which is now. We outnumber you, you know, two and a half to one or something. He's winning, though. He's winning. see his shield. I don't know what's happening. So Brooke probably isn't going to make it. Got him. Barely. That's a good sign. All right. That could be the thing that we need. That could be the destabilizing element that, that gets us where we're trying to be. We don't need much. We just need something to break the stalemate. And this could be it. Someone else is killed. All right, sounds fun. I will say this for the Union today. It seems as if their officer corps is very effective. Uh, or rather lethal. They're very lethal. There we go. 
All right. All right, you rest. You're fine. You've earned it. Goodness. Wish you could keep these units. They are going to have some great stats. Another charge. Ill-fated. There you go. Lots of melee kills. First brigade surrender. Alright. Let us begin the offensive. It's time. So now we come out, and essentially the goal is to sort of scour them from the map. And you don't need to do this. You don't, you don't, you, you can just hold the fort and you'll win. Um, but every time you kill someone in the enemy army, there's a chance that they drop their equipment. Um, and. Early on, especially, that equipment is usually worth... It's worth trying to get. Uh, especially in the Confederates, it's... it's it's Their equipment situation is not an encouraging one at the uh, onset of the campaign. It's one that begs for improvement, I shall say. And given that I don't get to keep any of these units after this battle, we're going to have the, uh, the, the, the AI units do the lion's share of the fighting here. Especially if you get to capture these can uh, uh, cannons. So I was saying, sorry, they, they drop their resources, right? Like X percent of them get, give you a musket or a cannon or whatever resource they've got. Um, so in a, in a very real way, especially with the Confederate Army, you're capturing a lot of the supplies and weapons you'll later end up using in your campaign. And you need them uh, to fight effectively. Because the Union has better stuff than you, and so you just need to take it from them to, to you know, to fight well. Uh, there's really a more important target, buddy.
Man. AI is tenacious on legendary. You just stick in there and take it. You're not blocked, but okay. They should surrender, or that what that works too. that will do for this mission. So you've taken and held the fort. I mean, there's nothing you can do about the ironclads. And I suppose you could keep fighting this out after the 10 minute countdown occurs. But why? You've captured. I'm happy with that. All right, Coles, victory units, whatever, officers, Melvin Canfield, annoying, James Burney, annoying, Tom's Preston, dead, incredibly annoying. He's our, he's supposed to be our first division commander, and now we need to find someone else to do the job, which is great. Uh, what do we capture? Um, some percussion muskets, some Lorenzes. This is a surprisingly high-end weapon. A uh, bunch of crap some money cool whatever this is a pretty good pretty good haul for tutorial all right so after the end of every one of these battles you're going to get uh some career points some reputation some money and some dudes you can get medals and stuff and that's mostly just for achievements and everything else um and then if you capture people they can be turned in for um more people so reputation using the top right of the screen here you have uh, a minimum you have to use, and uh, essentially, it's it's you bartering back in Richmond or Washington, depending on which faction you're playing. So normally, I get the 1841s, and that's it. I'm debating getting the 1841s and the James and James Archer. Actually, I'm going to do exactly that going to get the 1841s and I'm going to get James Archer. Now, my reputation is dangerously low, but yes, James Archer is a good unit commander who I would love to put in a gosh darn unit in this next mission, but we're going to need to just level somebody else up. So the next point is we talked about unit perks which is the, with the one we have here for Musketry Drill and these units. We also have Core Commander perks. This is my avatar, Legendary Fiasco. Starts off with one perk. 
And we have strategy plus accuracy. We have tactics plus charge damage. And we have lives in the saddle plus speed on the battlefield. And we're going to go ahead and pick accuracy because in this game, everybody needs to be good at shooting. Uh, but the speed is a viable pick too. Uh, Cable starts off with kind of a shit perk. Um, for what we're trying to do for this unit. This is a good perk, but not for this unit. So we're going we're gonna to delete him and then remake him. Sam Cable, same unit. We're going to give him the uh, ordnance guns again. I don't mind that. And he's good enough, thanks to the uh, high training stats of the, of the Confederacy, that we can pick a new perk. So Horse Artillery is the perk we used to have. Gave you speed, rotational speed, uh, which is quickly, like how quickly the unit turns around and stuff. Uh, the short range focus, which boosts the canister damage on the gun, or the long range focus, which boosts the shot shell damage on the gun. Now, ordnance guns are kind of a jack of all trades, medium range gun, and later on in the campaign, if I can, I'm gonna be replacing the ordnance guns here with James guns, which are uh, these guys, and they're excellent, just excellent all rangers, and in my mind, basically just kind of a passive step up from the the three inch ord. Uh, so we have Cable's new unit, we have Kemper and Siegfried, and you always want to be keeping in mind where you need to be and where you got to go, where you got to go in the middle there. So the next big battle we got coming up is Bull Run. Bull Run is a five brigade battle. You have some AI units and you have some enemy units. Now I don't have enough recon points to use any of them yet. And in the interim, we have to fight the battle at Newport News. Now the Newport News skirmish if the game is unmodded, is a three-person unit or a three-man. It's a three-brigade battle. In the mod, is the four-brigade battle. So we need to add at least one brigade to this army. And since we know we need to grow to four or five for Bull Run, and we can only have four right now, what does that mean? It means our point has to go into AO. And then we'll come back and take a look. So we have one core, two divisions, four brigades. If we push it to AO3, nice which job. we need to go there anyway, we can have five brigades in the Battle of Bull Run. And that will save us having to have another light colonel or whatever. We can just have all five of our units in this one division under James Archer. All right, so how are we doing on officers? We've got no one already. We got $85,000 and 9,429 men to make up our two units. And we need to refill these if we if we can, which we just bought a whole bunch of um, 80, 1841 muskets to do it with, which are great. They're good weapons. We have, we can fill this unit out some. Uh, we shouldn't use vets to do it because we don't, we don't gain any stats. Um, I'm actually fine. I think I think making one big, nice, plump artillery unit is going to be good. Have a nice, powerful effect on the battlefield. And then, uh, what do we do for the third unit? So the 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 standard option, the boring option, is uh a, a f another infantry unit, and I think that that's a pretty solid choice. Um. But there is some thought to maybe a light infantry unit or possibly a cavalry unit. Um, and at the moment, I'm actually leaning towards probably doing a cav unit. But before we do that, we should take a look at... So if you're playing the game, you want to keep certain weapons in, in mind. And the 24-pound howitzer is sort of the king of the howitzer game. So buy it when you get it early on. Now, because my logistics score is kind of low, um, I'm only going to have limited access to some of these weapons. I'm going to have no access to other ones, like 20-pound parrots, which is the king of long-range work. However, I do have access to the 10-pound parrot. The 10-pound parrot's a cheap, affordable, you know, easy-to-access, ex excellent long-range weapon uh, platform. And we're going to go ahead and use it as such. You're going to get... Uh, 
plenty of six pounders. You're going to get plenty of 12 pounders. You got plenty of Napoleons. So don't spend a dime on any of these. Certainly not these overinflated prices. And the Blakely's crap. So don't use it. Um, now I bought, uh, with reputation, 1841s. Now it's a lesser gun than the MJ and G. So why am I talking about using the 1841 instead? Because you have a lot more of them, basically. Uh, I don't like the 1855 because at max range it drops off in terms of usefulness pretty significantly. So don't use that if you can avoid it. Um, and then I picked up the scope Whitworth for the skirmishers because eventually I'm going to want to make a sniper unit and that's great uh, for utilizing with the sniper unit. We're going to go ahead and ye get some of these units up to what I like to treat as my regulation fighting strength, 1250. Because of the insane high uh, early perks in training, we don't even lose a lot of stats. Isn't that great? We barely lose any stats in the process. So these units are basically like as good as they were at the end of that last battle. They don't lose any stats or anything. They're just back up to full strength. Uh, so let's figure out what we're gonna do in terms of who we're gonna put in this unit. I'd like to put, let's see. Sir, yes sir! All right, so some of this stuff is like an experiment, right? So you figure out who you can get away with. I think Colonel Nelson here will do the trick. Sir, yes, sir! He will. Excellent. So uh, we're going to go ahead and stand up um, a light cavalry unit. So you have uh, perks on the cavalry. Now you notice they're different than those on the infantry. So uh, morale damage received, okay. Speed and rotational speed, okay. Accuracy and reload time. Now, uh, you gotta think about with cavalry, you gotta think about what you wanna do with the unit. With really anything, with perk selection, you've gotta think about what you wanna do with the unit. Um, and in the case here, I'm not making a melee cavalry unit. I'm making what amounts to dismounted light infantry, essentially. So I really need to be thinking about what I want them to be doing. And the answer here is I want them to be fighting as dismounted infantry um, or skirmishing, you know, when they when they when they come off their horseback. I need them to be big enough to hand, like be useful in a fight. I need them to um, you know, have enough guns to, to do some damage and I need them to be able to take a hit and not just fall to shit immediately. So this is our command uh, going forward into uh, Newport News. I'm gonna go ahead and bump up actually. That's gonna drive me bonkers. So we're gonna that extra five hundred dollars would just drive me nuts. So we're gonna go into Newport News. This is a slightly different start than I usually do. So usually I go in with three brigades of of a thousand men uh, with eighteen forty ones or other good weapons, and then uh, a close range cannon unit. We're changing it all up um, for two units of twelve fifty. Dismounted skirmishers and cable. Uh, however, we've gone, I think, long enough. So I will see you cats in the next video. And, and the spot here, this third spot, will almost certainly be another infantry brigade going into the Battle of Bull Run. You need, you need plenty of foot power uh, in Bull Run. So I'll see you guys in the next one. This is Fiasco signing out. I am very excited to see where this series goes. I am nervous about Legendary, but I think we got this. So I'll see you then. So yes, is uh, you guys have a good one. This is Fiasco. Let's see the next one.